Hey, good morning, Living Hope. Good to see you today. If it's your uh, first time here, if you're new or returning or online, we welcome you today. We're so glad you're here. We have a live stream host. Uh, they're going with you today and they're by, by your side. Check in right now on social media if you're holding your piece, uh, your, your phone. Check in or check in online. We want to know you're there and just with us together in this. Hey, you know, we love our youth, right? Our youth are great. And they're about to leave us, but before they do, uh, Cam was just led in her devotions this morning, and she comes to prayer this morning, and she says, God was just speaking to me this morning about how that God could even speak through a donkey. So he definitely can speak through Doug. No, she didn't say that. <laughs> but she, her heart was so pure in it, and we all got a good laugh, because she was trying to say that God really can speak through a donkey. That's incredible. She didn't realize, because she's young, that the King James it didn't refer to it as a donkey, right? <laughs> But let's give the youth a big hand as they leave today. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Cam. Thank you for your leadership. Hey, this stage looks a lot better than it normally does today, right? There's a pretty face up here with me, my lovely wife, Holland Frazier. You know, the thing about Living Hope is we have a lot going on. We talk about that a lot. There's, but there's the unseen. There's the profoundly unseen. And you're about to hear one of those things today. My wife is a president of a global ministry that impacts orphans across the world. And she just does an incredible job. But the cool thing is, is that's an extension of this body. You know, when we all go do various ministries, whether they're directly affiliated with Living Hope or not, that's for the kingdom of God. It's all about Jesus and promoting His goodness in the world and the gospel. And my wife does a tremendous job with her team. And I'm going to give her the floor for just a few minutes. I think. Uh, she's going to start, and I'm going to close with a wrap about God's call to the orphan as well, to be being a cycle breaker. So with all that said, let me pray, and she'll take the floor. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you go before us in the things of this life, Lord. And Lord, I just uh, praise your name that you have chosen my wife and I to do complex work for you, Jesus. It's not easy. It's hard. But Lord, we do it for your honor and glory. And Lord, we celebrate that we're breaking cycles of sin and generational decision-making that has destroyed people across the street and around the world. Lord, as we open our hearts to being cycle breakers today, Lord, speak to us all that we can end the sin in our own life. And if we know you as Savior, we can be about being an ambassador to end it in others' lives, Lord. Where sin comes to destroy Jesus, you come to save. Lord, speak through my wife and I this morning. We trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Gosh, thank you so much, Living Hope Church, for having me here this morning. I am so excited to share a little bit about All God's Children International and how the Lord is truly breaking cycles of generational sin and trauma around the world. Um, but for those of you who don't know, all God's Children was actually founded 32 years ago when my older sister traveled to war-torn Romania and did the adoption of my youngest sister for my parents. Out of Hannah's adoption, All God's Children was born. And for the next 25 years, we would go on to work in 27 countries, open 11 children's homes, and unite over 4,500 children with their forever families through adoption. But in 2016, God met me in an orphanage in Haiti and everything changed. I walked into this dark and dreary orphanage room and I saw children in cages from the floor to the ceiling. They were all lying despondent in their urine-soaked clothes. And what I saw and smelled in that room that day rocked me to my core. I instantly flashed back to 20 years earlier when I was just 18 and traveled to my first government institution in the country of Bulgaria. Instead of cribs from floor to ceiling, I walked into a room with more than 50 children, babies, lying in rows of cribs, completely despondent, in complete silence because they had given up the will to live. And in that moment in Haiti, I was so convicted that we weren't doing enough. 
We'd been serving vulnerable children and families for 25 years at that point, and I still was walking into rooms like that. And I left that room that day knowing that God was asking us to believe him for every single one of the estimated 8 million children that are languishing in institutions today. So I left that orphanage and came home, and we ended up making the decision to close all of our children's homes, and we launched our very first child advocacy center in the country of Colombia. This child advocacy center has a vision to empower local leaders to create pathways to faith, family, and independence for the children we serve. We knew the solution had to be holistic and that we had to get at the root of trauma if we were ever going to break the vicious cycles of sin that break families and place children into institutions. So we launched this first child advocacy center with a focus on first and foremost preventing children from ever entering institutions by strengthening families and healing relationships. We then have gone on to provide this elevated care to institutions and foster families so that children that are in these places can grow into their God-given potential. We work to place children first into their biological families, back to their biological families, and when that is not possible, into a forever family through adoption. And we prepare the youth, the vast number of youth that are aging out of these systems um, through vocational training programs, college, um, so that they can break that cycle and actually have a path to independence. And lastly, we are transforming policy because we know that the greatest reach to the most children is through sound policy. So in just the last six years since launching our Child Advocacy Center, we have seen a decrease in the number of children in their child welfare system of over 51,000 children. We've passed, thank you. We've passed laws that provide a pathway for 26,800 children to be reunified with their families or on an adoption registry to find a forever family through adoption. And today, we have broken the cycle for 43,000 children who are now healing from trauma through our partnerships with local leaders on the ground. And as we've taken this work throughout Columbia, we then traveled across the world to Africa and launched our second child advocacy center in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Ethiopia is very different than Colombia as they do not have a developed child welfare system. So instead of children languishing in institutions, in Ethiopia, children are literally living on the streets. So in partnership with the Tim Tebow Foundation, we opened the first trauma-informed home called the House of Hope in Addis, where we are caring for 24 young girls who were working to reunify them with their families. Just last week, we served our 50th young girl in this home, and I am super just blessed to share that we have now reunified 28 girls with their families, and today all 28 are still thriving in their homes. Yes. But one of these girls that we served, um, her name is Tadalak. And Tadalak was born to a single mom who was living in extreme poverty, unable to feed her kids, her five kids. Um, so her mom ended up sending Tadalak to go live with her uncle around the age of five. For the next four and a half years, she would really do well with her uncle, except he started to feel some guilt about the fact he was unable to send her to school because he lived just on the outskirts of the city. So Tadalek's uncle called another family member in the city and asked if Tadalek could come live with them so she could go to school. They said yes, and Tadalek went. Sadly, Tadalek never went to school. She became the servant in that home. And on a daily basis, the uncle in that home abused her in every way imaginable. This abuse went on for months. And when her aunt found out, she accused Tadalek of adultery and took her to the local police station where she filed formal charges against this precious 11-year-old girl of adultery. And they put her in prison for the next 30 days. 
She went two to three days at a time without food, and on the 30th day, the judge over the case found her innocent. And that photo you just saw taken was the day she showed up at our House of Hope door. This little girl was broken, she was scared, she had a laundry list of health issues, she couldn't trust anyone. And slowly, as we began working with her, and um, just we started to see this sweet little girl just start to transform as she started to believe and understand her preciousness in the Lord. Um, as we were working on really this healing transformation for Tadalek, we went on to find her birth mom who still was not in a place to take her back. And then we went on to find the original uncle. When he heard of the abuse that she um, fell under, he was devastated. So our team worked with him for a number of months to deal not only with his grief and guilt, but also really prepare him on how to meet the needs of Tadalek. And I am so thrilled to share that this fall, we finally reunified Tadalek with her uncle. Yes. She is currently um, attending school. We figured out how to get her into school, and she is thriving. And now Tadalak may have children one day, and because of the healing that she experienced, that cycle of trauma will be ended forever. So as we look to the future, thank you, as we look to the future and the work that the Lord is doing in Latin America and Africa, we also are setting our sights on Asia this next year. We're looking to launch our third child advocacy center um, in the country of the Philippines. And we're just continuing to watch God just open doors we would have never dreamed or imagined. Um, but in closing, I just wanna share, you know, someone asked me a couple weeks ago, what one of my highlights was last year. And for a couple years now, All God's Children, we've been in a vision um, process where we've really been praying and seeking the Lord on where he wants us to go and how he wants us um, to really be his hands and feet extended to those in need. And as we were feeling an urge that he was wanting us to believe him for bigger than just Colombia, but really looking at all of Latin America, um, only through God, I got this crazy, only God-ordained meeting in Ecuador with the first lady of the country. Um, last March, actually, I got on a plane with about a couple weeks' notice, but I was told I would have 30 minutes to present a two-day proposal to train some leaders in the country on what it looks like to actually have trauma-informed care for their hurting and vulnerable. I was expecting to walk into an office and with a translator have this brief meeting with her, but instead was, was driven up to the presidential palace where they brought me into a ballroom with every historical president of Ecuador around the room, a massive table with 30 name tags, and what I thought was gonna be a very brief one-on-one -on -one meeting ended up meeting with a cabinet that included ministers and vice ministers and the first lady. Um, so, of course, I, I had a paper proposal. I called my team frantically. I need a PowerPoint. They got me the PowerPoint, thankfully. But um, what I thought was going to be 30 minutes was an hour and a half. And after we were taking photos, um, she asked me if she could take me upstairs and show me her presidential quarters. So I followed her up, and she was walking me through her beautiful home. And at the end of the evening, we ended on her veranda as the sun was going down, overlooking downtown Quito, and all the churches lit up. And she turned to me and said, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah, you can ask me anything. And she went on to say, do you have faith? And I said, you know, I actually do have faith. It's the, not only the foundation of my life, it's the foundation of all God's children. And this little tool we talked about, trust-based relational intervention today, it's just the gospel in action. And she looked at me and said, I want you to know that I share that same deep faith. And I know the Lord has brought you here for a reason and that together we are gonna bring healing and transformation to my people. Yes. 
And I think why that was a highlight for me last year, it's not because it was a president's wife, it, it's not any of that. It's because we were in a posture of prayer, seeking the Lord's heart. And as we were wrestling with, can we really take this work and expand it in, in this big of a way, um, God was just out there doing it opening the doors, just saying, trust me, walk through, and I have it. And I just think it's such a great reminder daily to me that even back in that room in Haiti in 2016, that God is always asking us to believe him for more. Where we think the ceiling is, it's always his floor. There, there's not a ceiling. And so um, I just, you know, I love our living hope church and the story here. You're such a God story of his provision. And, and I look at all God's children and I see that same story. And as we look out over the next five years, we are trusting him to not only expand throughout Latin America, but Africa and then Asia. And so in closing, I really do just want to thank you, Living Hope Church. Um, I, I know that I am not a typical pastor's wife. You don't always see me here on Sundays. Unfortunately, this work does take me away often. I travel the world, I travel throughout the US, um, but I want you to know how much we appreciate and value your love, your prayers, your support. We love this church, and I just thank you so much for how well you love us back. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Now you've heard from somebody that isn't a donkey, but it's time for the donkey to talk. <laughs> what an incredible ministry. The extension of our body across the world that God allows us to be used this way. You see, the Bible is clear that we are all God's children. Yes, He created every single one of us. Psalms 139, he, 119, he, he, wombed, he weaved us in our mother's womb. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says that we're made in his, his image and likeness. We're all his children. But when Jesus came and he died and he rose again, we must now submit to him for him to be our eternal father. Colossians 1, 16 says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. You see, when we come to Christ... We learn eternal, eternally that we are saved forever. For God so loved this world that he gave his only son that if we believe in him, we will not perish but have everlasting life. You must be born of Jesus Christ, as John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. The story of all God's children is an incredible story. It's about taking the love and life of Jesus Christ across the world to give orphans hope. We all spiritually were orphaned. Without Jesus, we were wondering. But along came the heart of our God, the one who was our creator. And he says this in Psalm 68, 5, I want to be a father of the fatherless, a judge for widows, is God in his holy calling. That's God's heart. God is a father to the fatherless. The word fatherless obviously means orphan, the one who is left without a father to the father is, is someone who defends for widows, those left behind. The story of the Bible is that in the time of Bible, abject poverty was much more profound than what it would be today. There were no institutions. There were no provisions. There were no government subsidies. When you were orphaned or widowed, you were fatherless. You were left on your own. You were absolutely abandoned. But God's heart is that you're not. God's heart is that he will meet that need. He presents himself as a father because he knows he's a good, good father. You see, the Christian religion that we know is not religion, it's relationship. But compared to other religions, is the only religion that announces God as the father. Incredible. He is saying to all of us, if you're fatherless or you have had a bad father, I want to adopt you, child. Ephesians 1. I will adopt you as sons and daughters and I will replace the broken glass of your life and you will be mine forever. God plants that understanding in our hearts if we know him today that we can be changed forever because of his love for us. Is that what you need in your life today? 
We, we have to take that message of hope to children across the world because 8 million children are living in horrible conditions. They deserve that, but they're not going to get the full picture of a double salvation if we're only humanitarian. We must go and see them rescued physically and then restored spiritually because that's what God's heart is for kids. That's what God's heart is for all of us. He wants to be our Father. God breaks the cycle of sin in our life. For many orphans, it's consequential sin. The Bible in Jeremiah 32, 18 talks about the consequences of sin from one generation are visited on the next generation. While in the Old Covenant, that, that is true. There were generational curses. In the New Covenant, there's an escape plan. And it's found in the name of Jesus Christ. And He ends the cycles of poverty. He ends, ends the cycles of despair and, and hopelessness. He ends all that is destructive in the world. When we give our heart and life to Jesus Christ, we're changed forever. I know that we've had adversity in this room for family members. I know that there's some of you that have been victims of horrible parenting. But I will tell you, you must forgive because Jesus forgave you. God instructs family members to honor and love one another. We need to be models once in Christ of what a good family looks like. I love my kids. I'm so proud of them. They're all doing well. But my, my faults, they can't blame. When you stand before God, if you've said no to Jesus Christ in your life, you can't blame it on anyone else. You take responsibility and you step forward and you play a role. You must love others. Because Christ first loved you. I want you to watch a video here of, of being a cycle breaker is the term. A cycle breaker is maybe there have been generations of sin. And these poor kids are victims of all these bad choices that exclude God, that exclude Christ. And I want this church to be about having a mindset that says in this place and in all of our ministries and in supporting all God's children, no more. We need to be victorious in this fight against evil and consequences. Watch this video. Trauma. For millions of vulnerable children and families across the globe, it affects every part of life. Trauma can come from poverty, abuse, neglect, natural disasters, a difficult pregnancy or birth, early hospitalization, or life in an institution. Trauma rewires the brain, making it all but impossible to break free of cycles of poverty and abuse. Trauma is the number one reason children are separated from their families and put into institutional care. The effects of trauma are passed down, creating a hopeless cycle. But for countless kids and families, when you become a cycle breaker, the hope of Christ is restored. Today, you can bring the hope and healing of Jesus to those in desperate need. As a cycle breaker, you will actively work to prevent children from entering institutions by creating stronger families and helping victims of abuse to overcome the trauma of their past. As a cycle breaker, you will provide support to caregivers to dramatically improve the care of the kids already living in institutions. For kids in institutions, you will actively work to safely place as many of them as possible back with their birth families and when reunification is not an option, you will place as many of those kids as possible into loving, prepared, forever families. As a cycle breaker, you will give older children at high risk for trafficking the opportunity to prepare for an independent adult life by helping them to overcome their traumatic past and by gaining vital skills through education and spiritual formation. And to see the greatest impact, as a cycle breaker, you will help to change policy that can prevent children and families from breaking free of their trauma. We all want to make a difference with the life the Lord has given each of us. And today you can break the cycle of trauma that keeps kids and families from thriving. Will you become a cycle breaker today? You might have seen these cards lying around. I challenge you to pray about filling out the info returning it to the hub or doing the QR code even if you say I don't have the means to do that I challenge you to pray because the ministry of all God's children they're on the front lines of work with the most abandoned children in the world God loves all his children 
and so should we. So should you, every one of us, church. If God has changed your life, then you are now adopted forever in Christ. Because of this promise, and I love this promise, in the story of the disciples in John 14, 18, Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I will not leave you as orphans. And in looking at that, that has nothing to do with uh, some kind of call to the orphans. It's, it's more of a, a story that's brief but powerful in the sense that God, Jesus, when he told stories, it was always what was around him. I imagine there was probably an orphan nearby. And he probably pointed and says, I will not leave you as an orphan. This poor, destitute child that has no resources and has no love, I'm not going to leave you that way. That's the heart of Jesus. He comes in and he says, I'm not going to leave you. I'm beside you. I'm all in to make sure your needs are met. I tell you to pray, our Father who art in heaven, because I believe in the paternal goodness of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he comes in and that helper does come and the the disciples who he didn't leave, they were one day powerfully used of God in a profound way to spread the gospel. That has to become all of our mindsets. It's not enough for Holland and her team to do all that they need to do around the world. It's all of our mindsets across the street, around the world. Are we making a difference in someone's life? We can't all go to Africa. We can't all go to developing world as missionaries, but we can all impact people with the love of Jesus Christ, and especially children. Most people receive Christ. 90% of people receive Christ before the age of 18. The urgency of being there and being present and having people that speak Jesus into the lives of young people is absolute everywhere, and we need to do it. I love the story of the starfish on the beach, and it was overwhelming amounts of starfish in A gentleman's just picking them up and tossing them back into the ocean. And this guy walks up to the the guy tossing the starfish and says, What are you doing? What a waste of time. There's so many starfish here. You're never going to get make any difference here. And as he tossed the, the next one, he said, It made a difference for this one. And that's what your heart should be in Christ. It's making a difference... As the old adage at All God's Children goes, making a difference one child at a time. There's 8 million. That's a big number. 8 million kids in, in kind of like a horrible scenario. But we can make a difference one child at a time together, right? We should do that. We should make that difference because, 90, as I said, 90% of kids will come to Christ before age 18. To review, God is a father to the fatherless. He he breaks the cycle of sin in our life that could be generational without Jesus. And boy, he loves his children. The two greatest commandments are love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Are you doing that? Are you loving God and all his children? Are you surrounding your life in love and support for others? I challenge you three ways today to apply this message. I challenge you to support foster families and children locally. Support them. Stand behind them. Give them a night off. Support adoptive families and adoption. If you know someone adopting, support that adoption. If you are praying about adopting, go for it. We need to adopt. And third, everyone in this room can be this, a cycle breaker. We can invest in sponsoring a child and sponsoring the work that must go on. As the worship band begins together behind me, I tell you this. This church is going places. Not because we're all this awesome army of great things that we do. It's because everything we try to do is to help the next person. We're not about pleasing ourselves. We're not about building this great uh, center for, that's all-powerful and, and luxury. We're just doing the basics to get through to impact more people. The great things that even you didn't know going on behind the scenes, the thousands of of impact that all God's children have on kids is so profound. But it's all for Him. These stats are not to elevate any one person. The stats of us seeing people come to Christ aren't to elevate a person. It's to elevate Jesus Christ. And I pray that today, you in your life, you're not an orphan. Because if you're spiritually without Jesus, you're orphaned. But he said, 
I will not leave you that way. And so he's coming to you right now with every head bowed and every eye closed. You ask in your heart this morning, am I an orphan? Am I someone that hasn't said yes to Jesus and the Holy Spirit has come into my heart? If that's you today, will you pray with me right now? Lord Jesus, adopt me as your child. I need a Savior. And Lord, I don't want to be an orphan anymore. So Lord, forgive me of my sin this day. Change my life and make me new. I believe you died on the cross for me and rose again. And I choose you this day as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that for the first time today, will you raise your hand so we can rejoice with you? A few hands around, praise God. Lord Jesus, thank you for these that have made that commitment. That Lord, there is a, a present physical orphan. There's millions of orphans around the world. And Lord, there's even more spiritual orphans today. But there are a few less because of your gospel in this room today. We praise you for that. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you provide for us and we can go out and make a difference. And so Lord, may we be that church that always loves its neighbor as itself. That we put others ahead of ourselves. That we make sure we're blessing people in our pathway. That we're making a difference one child at a time. Lord, we thank you for this word today. We believe you, God, for our future. Because, Lord, it's not about a person. It's not about a place. It's about you, Jesus. Only Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord together. And we're going to sing, No Longer Slaves to Sin. I'm a child of God. A child of God. Amen. If you need prayer, please come join me at the front. I'll be here to receive you. That song has a whole new context today, right? We can stop generational consequence in Jesus' name, and we're no longer slaves to the mistakes in previous generations. We can overcome. Hey, I, I want to tell you the end of a story uh, that Holland didn't mention. She did in the first service. But that, when she met with that first lady, that was a powerful moment in her life. But six months later, it was even more powerful because by decree of the president of, of Ecuador, is that it, Ecuador? Yeah, Ecuador, yeah, yeah. 650 child care workers from the entire country gathered to be trained by All God's Children on how to properly care for children. So sometimes, sometimes God cracks the door through a relationship like that, but rarely does it move that powerful. That's an only God story. What's your only God story as you leave today? Is it, what is it? God wants to use us all. None of us have any reason not to be used. And I want to tell you, I'm going to lead in just a minute in the library a next step class where you can find out about our church and learn what is your next step in ministry. We all need to be participating in these last days so that we can reach that next person or that next child for Jesus Christ. So go today in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. God bless you all. Thank you.